Michael Carvin, and of course Martin Bernard is my advisor. So you know, it's my job to actually make sense out of a lot of crazy statements that come out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and in particular, what we're interested in is um, figuring out how we can relax programs, right? You know, kick back, relax our programs, but still be assured that you know our application is going to follow. So now I think Ravi actually stole my intro, um, but I do agree with them that the reason why we're here at Races and why we're looking at these relaxation techniques um, is that we're seeing a lot more approximate computing um, coming into our life, right, on our cell phones. Just everything we're doing is around search, you know, media processing, machine learning, um, all these types of domains where the problems are inherently kind of fuzzy. Right? And by fuzzy, I mean there's this inherent trade-off between you know, accuracy, so how accurate some particular solution is, um, and cost. So in many of these domains, right, there's some ideal, um, extremely expensive solution that you have you know, up here on the right. Um, but there are also you know, a wide variety of less accurate less expensive solutions that we can actually use um, in certain scenarios. Now, I think what we're really aiming to hit at um, today at RACES is how do we adapt you know, the standard program model where we have one point in a trade-off space. So where we build a program <coughs> and it typically occupies one point in the space. Right? We just design some spe specific trade-off between accuracy of your results um, and resources. And how do we adapt that model to a relaxed program model where we can admit multiple executions um, in the sense that our application and actually occupy multiple points in the space, and perhaps even do this dynamically um, and automatically. So not only are you able to you know, trade accuracy for increased performance, but you can actually now have applications um, that can notice that they've lost computational resources, for example, um, scale back and do something different, drop some accuracy there to keep up with the demand. Um, now there are a couple ways that we've seen in the community of how we go about producing these relaxed programs. Um, so at the top, we have something like you know, task skipping, loop perforation. Um, where we have some large distributed computation, and we're going to drop some tasks. We're just going to drop some of that work that we should do and still compute a result. Um, we're also seeing some hardware approaches like these approximate memories. We're actually building hardware um, that can go in these low power states where the um, results of the compute can be lost. Right? So you might get bit flips um, in your L1 cache or something like this. Um, and the idea there is that, well, you're not going to get the exact thing that you put in back, um, but you're going to save something out. Um, and then, of course, today we're seeing you know, unsynchronized parallelization, this relaxed synchronization, um, where we're taking locks out of a program, we're relaxing the semantics of errors to get some performance. Now, the question is, you know, when is this acceptable? And Ravi brought this up in his talk. Um, and the way we've been thinking about acceptability or defining acceptability in our group it was exactly as Martin had laid out. So we're thinking about specifying properties that are in particular to a client um, or a domain, um, such that you know, if any, if such that any implementation that satisfies these properties should be acceptable for that particular user scenario. Um, now these properties are really breaking down into a few things that we see. So these accuracy properties, where we have components in the system um, that we want to bound, um, how much error they can put out, right? How different they're going to be from you know, some idealized execution. Um, and we also have these integrity properties, where we're interested in constraining the interactions between components and systems, and also constraining the executions of components. So maybe we have a system composed of, composed of both approximate um, and non-approximate components, and we want to enforce some sort of isolation, where we say that I don't want approximation flowing into this part of my system, right? So that might be some sort of integrity property you might be interested in. Um, but we also have you know, safety properties, which you normally think of, things like pointer safety, um, you know, no division by zeros, what have you, these types of things. Um, and you know, the question I want to talk about today is how do we verify you know, the safety or safety properties for these programs? Now, when we typically think about verifying safety properties, we think about something like poor logic. Um, and if you're familiar with core logic, it kind of has this syntactic form up here that says that if I know P is true of some program, um, at this program point, um, and I execute some statement S, then Q is going to be true, right? So something simple we have is, you know, if X is equal to 1, execute X is equal to S plus 1, then I can prove that X is equal to 2 after that. Now, the issue here is that we found that standard core logic doesn't really capture um, the way we want to reason about verifying relaxed programs. And um, the way we did this is by building a general model for relaxing sequential programs. Um, and this was something that we explored and we actually had in PLDI um, this past year, so in June. Um, and what's going on here, I just want to illustrate what we actually put here. So I just have this loop down here, so this for loop. Um, it's just simple, it just you know, starts at zero, iterates up through n, and does some computation for each iteration. And let's say we want to loop, uh, implement loop perforation. So what we want to do is truncate the number of iterations we're going to do by bringing down this upper bound, right, n. Um, so what we came up with was this relaxed statement, which um, is a non-deterministic relaxation of some statement of the program. 
And so the way you might relax your program is you're going to write your original program, then you're going to add relax statements to it. And this is, you know, this isn't an explicit implementation, but more of a way of modeling this type of phenomenon. Um, and how this works is you have some set of variables that you're going to change non-deterministically, and they're going to be changed subject to a constraint. Right? So this relaxation. So here what we're going to say is we're going to change the value of n um, so that it's less than or equal to its old value. So the old being the value before entering the state. Um, this gets exactly what we want for loop preparation. We're going to truncate the number of iterations we're going to do. So with this primitive, um, let's figure out what happens you know, when we apply or try to prove this you know, properties um, using standard for logic. So here I just have this abstract example where I've taken, we had a code block um, where we wanted to prove some assertion in the program. So let's say that was the original program. In the original program, we had some assertion that we wanted to prove on R and S. Um, and I split this code block in half by adding a relaxed statement where I'm just going to non-deterministically you know, modify X. And this could capture something like approximate merits, um, for example. Now, if we do some um, verification with the logic, what we're going to see is that after this first code block, we're going to we're going to establish maybe some property P and some property Q. And when we go and do the relaxation, um, what we're going to see is we're going to lose this property P, right? Because we arbitrarily modified X. Um, so you know, P is not going to be true. We've lost all relations about uh, we've lost all relations about X. Um, but we can still keep Q around because Q is just a function of Y alone. Now, after the second code block, right? Obviously, what we're going to have to do is prove that both R and S hold. We actually need to prove this assertion so that we can verify this is going to be true of the program. Now, if you look a little bit closely here, what you'll see is that you know this relaxation didn't actually modify Y. So. It doesn't really make any sense why we should have to prove this property x, this property s, which is only a function of y. Intuitively, if it was true in the original program, um, and we didn't modify anything about y, then it should be true in the relaxed program. What if y is influenced by, by x in that second book of code? So yes, there are in situations where you could have that. But in this situation, I don't. Let's just say that you know, it's going to be an independent variable. You can still uh, reason about relations like that if you want to, or I'm about to show. Um, so what we came up with is we realized that we could you know, capture this intuition that perhaps we're proving too much about our relaxed program by looking at um, relational verification techniques. In particular, we came up with a relational program logic um, for verifying these types of programs. So what happens here is I have kind of this, this is a, um, this is going to be our relational or logic style judgment. And what we have here um, is this predicate now is actually over of variables in the original program and the relaxed program. So I have this funny syntax here that says x angle bracket r. That's in reference to the value of x in the relaxed program. x angle bracket o is a reference to the value of x in the original program. So what this assertion here says is that you know, x is the same in the original relaxed program and y is the same in the original relaxed program. Now, if I execute a relaxed statement where I just change x um, arbitrarily, well, now that value of x is going to be different between the original and relaxed program. However, y is still going to stick around. Right? We still know that y is the same. So now let's go ahead and apply our relational program logic um, to the same you know, abstract example. So after the first code block, um, what we can see now is we have a different judgment that we're doing. Right? We split this code block in half with a relaxed statement. And we can actually you know, fairly syntactically see that there are no relaxed statements. So all the variables in the program should be the same between um, the original relaxed versus the program. So let's just say that's going to be x and y. So we're going to say that x and y um, you know, have the same values respectively in the original relaxed program. And then using what we had from the slide before, um, now we're going to see that you know, we're going to keep around this relationship on y. So we still know that y is the same in the original logic program. Now, after the second code block, right, now we're, we're still going to have to verify that r is true. Right? We can't avoid that. We modify x. Um, and we need to reestablish that this property um, on x actually can still be proved. So we're going to have to do that if we want to discharge this assertion. But now notice that we don't need to prove x. Um, and in fact, we can actually use this intuition as we had before. Well, if S was true in the original program, um, and Y is the same in both the original and relaxed program, then S is true in this relaxed program. And what's cool about this is these types of relations that we can um, use in our verification process really serves as this bridge um, to transfer this reasoning that we have in the original program over to the relaxed program. So we don't have to try and reprove all these properties that we haven't really interfered with. Now, What's interesting here is that the judgment that we get is now going to be different than the normal way we think about verifying programs. Typically, what we have um, is this judgment where we say, for all executions, you know, some property is true about that program. That's no longer true. What we now have is actually, you know, if the original program satisfied all the assertions, then the relaxed program satisfies all the assertions. Now, what's kind of cool about this, actually, so, is that 
The way we establish this for the original program can be however you want it to be. Right? So this could be verification if you have the time for doing that. Um, but it could be testing or code review. And what you know is that you do a if you do a proof in this type of logic or using this type of reasoning, you know that if you observe some type of error in the program, it's actually due to something um, that was wrong in your original reasoning about the program. It has nothing to do with relaxation. Relaxation has not interfered with the correctness uh, for these types of properties that have been proved. Uh, now, if you want to see more details of you know, how relative safety really plays out, you can look in our PLEI paper. But in our races paper, um, we came up with a small formalization of how you might want to do um, unsynchronized parallelization or, synchroni or um, synchronization reduction, where we're going to take these locks and remove we'll them from the program and come up with the semantics for the program. And um, then we have a formal safety or a formal statement of relative safety um, within this context of how this type of definition might work. Um, and then finally, we just have a really simple example um, from the J parallel benchmark suite of how you might want to do this. So the takeaway that I hope you have from all this talk um, is that you know I well so um, again I'm a student of Martin, so I'm definitely in this camp that we should be relaxing the semantics of programs. Um, right? This is a great way um, to not only get some performance, um, but also to give new flexibility out. Allow them to dynamically adapt, right? If you lose a core, you know, you can actually scale down and trade some accuracy and keep up with your um, performance demands or um, the real-time requirements that you might have in the system. Now, you know, everyone in this room, uh, I mean, because everyone in this community is really concerned about how we preserve safety or how we reason about safety in the program. Um, and of course, we definitely need to preserve safety as you apply these relaxations. Um, but what I think we're seeing and what we're seeing in our group is that one productive way to go about doing this is to actually reuse the proofs. Um, that we did, or reuse the reasoning that we did about the original program, um, so that we can actually establish the, the safety of these relaxed programs on the other side, without reduplicating all this effort um, that we did to begin with. So, thank you. Um, that's pretty much it. We've got a couple minutes for questions. Okay. I found your argument that being able to know that some problem associated with S must have been there in the original program more compelling than the reduced proofs. Well, S simply yeah. because in my experience, it's really exactly do, figuring the proof, not discharging it through a theorem proof, and take the time. No, I agree. So, um, so if you actually look at this judgment, if you actually take the contrapositive of it, what it says is that you know if you violate a search in the relaxed program, um, then you have violated a search. There yes. must be some execution. In the and that's really the way I like to think about it. And I think it just depends on who you're talking to. People, some people want to think about it in this definition, some people want to think about it in no. But I definitely, that's one that I like. I don't think people do reuse proofs in practice. Well, that's, that's the other thing. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, our model incorporates you know, explicit assumptions, right? And assumptions, when you have an assumption and verification system, you don't need to provide any proof for it. I mean, there, what we want to say is, like, well, if you observe a violation of the assumption in a relaxed program, then this assumption is not your original program, right? And there doesn't need to be any proof associated. Uh, nice talk. Um, I understood correctly, right, that the relax is, is sort of a statement that you put into your model of the program, right? Yep. So I'm, I'm trying to think about Martin's example where, uh, where you know, I write back a, an old value and at that moment the shared variable I'm writing back to yeah. goes backwards. How is that explicitly modeled? So, no, this is a very good question. So actually, I got this at the end of um, when I was talking about some of this for the PLDI talk, and people were wondering, you know, how might you express this in a concurrent model? So one thing you could do right, with these relaxed statements, you could just use this chaos semantic where you say that, well, this is going to be relaxed. Maybe there's going to be contention on this variable. So it could just have any value. Right? Clearly, that's not going to be true in a concurrent environment where you could do some sort of verification. There are going to be properties about that value that's being modified. And I think going forward, we need to figure out ways that we can express um, that type of you know, constraint on what might happen when we have beta races on these types of variables. So yeah, it's a very good question. OK, uh, we're out of time for questions right now. But thanks again. Thank it's uh, time for the break. And uh, when we come back, which will be at uh, 35 past, 10, 1035, we're going to have um, Hans tell us that the data races are real evil. And that will lead into a nice discussion when we can um, figure out how everything we've heard so far this morning can simultaneously be true. So thank you very much. <laughs> Back in, at 35 past. <laughs>